Welcome to Movie Watch from Cambridge. At the forefront of technology and sitting squarely at the end of the M11, Cambridge is anything but a purpose-built extension to the city's famous university. After all, they've given us Dina Carroll and the world's first and last Sinclair C5. When the City Council decided to copy Amsterdam's environmentally friendly scheme of putting free bikes on the street, they didn't bank on them all getting stolen on day one. But at least now there's enough bikes in circulation to give everyone in Cambridge an average of 0.5 of a bicycle. Tonight, our Cambridge reviewers discover the LA mean streets of menace to society. Yes. And a rather lean and mean Al Pacino in Carlito's way. I take a ride with Rutger Hauer on the set of his new movie, Nostradamus. And Laurie talks exclusively to Boston b-boy Marky Mark and meets the music video directors taking Hollywood by storm. An honest pint has got to be this city's second passion with more pubs per square mile than anywhere else in England. And with a watering hole on every corner, there's usually enough time after last orders to nip off to the cinema and catch the late movie. So where better to find four film goers to review this week's film? And here they are! As the Cambridge cocktail barman, Ilya has a very mixed personality. He wishes he was Tom Cruise, has been mistaken for George Michael, but is really into Robert De Niro and Jonathan Ross. Elise has studied films, flown planes and sings. What a happy soul. Elise's only hang-ups are her addiction to Diet Fanta, excessive television and wacky clothes. Tony's got some very strange theories on life. He thinks Captain Kirk envied Spock's sex appeal, thinks Captain Scarlet's the world's worst actor and thinks he's the next captain of British techno. Emma might be the new Bond girl. This very gifted 18-year-old has already fallen off mountains, swam rivers and sat through daytime TV. Studying German, French and Latin, she's also got the gift of the gab. Tonight's first film is Friends, the twisting story of three young women surviving the chaos of Johannesburg. Set shortly before the release of Nelson Mandela, the film follows their friendship amidst a divided South Africa. Dear Dolly, whenever I have my hair plated, hey, I go back. Plated with extensions, it falls out in large chunks afterwards. I lost my man to a girl with a Kelly perm. Am I doing anything wrong? <laughs> I've waited for too long to see that laugh. Maybe my husband would love me if I was permed. Mine liked plaits best. Or if I had long red hair like your friend. Sophie. After he came out of the army, her husband didn't notice her anymore. The men have forgotten we are beautiful. This is definitely not the definitive film on South Africa. This is a film that sort of makes the whole situation look laughable. It, it's, it's something like The Breakfast Club. There's a great bond between the three main characters. However, the film never explains how this bond was formed or why it has survived so long. Sophie is a very, very uh, unpredictable, irrational, uh, insane bomber type person. <laughs> I was trying to decide whether she was actually um, a part of the militant organisation because she really, really believed in breaking down the apartheid. I was a good soldier. Or actually, if she was just attracted by the danger and the violence. The end of the film is not particularly uplifting as the three main characters are left out in the middle of nowhere, cut off from mainstream society. And the struggle is definitely not over. I think it's good for people who want to see an image of Africa to see how it's divided up, to see how it can affect three different sorts of people as well as three different sorts of origins. When I finished watching it, I just thought, thank God it's over. It was very, very boring indeed. I give friends three out of ten. Six. Seven. One. Which gives friends 17 points. He's made hit records, a workout video, and even a video game. And now, Marky Mark is all set to become the next biggest thing in Hollywood with the release of his debut film, Renaissance Man. Laurie Pike met up with him for a few exclusive words. The mad fly flicks. In Renaissance Man, Marky plays a raw recruit opposite Danny DeVito and Gregory Hines in Uncle Sam's Finest. <laughs> 
Have you ever considered joining the Army in no. real life? I, I did, but I wouldn't admit to it now. <laughs> but you are admitting to it. Oh. So it was brief, probably. Yeah. All right. I'm glad they wouldn't take me. Why not? Because uh, I, I was in a little bit of trouble with the law when I was young. Huh. Marky is a bad, bad boy. In 1988, he spent 45 days in jail for assault. Huh. I never really knew what a renaissance man was until I started doing the movies, but I've, I've done a lot of different things. I've been able to, you know, really do what I do well. Morning. Sure has. Marky's coining it. The original Renaissance man, Michelangelo, didn't have a pop career, didn't have a video game, ooh, looking good, and didn't have a workout video. Check this out. Marky is believed to be one of the sexiest men alive, but some men are jealous of his pooling power. Is there a love scene in the movie? See, can I ask you, though, see, there's two different people would think sex and people humping each other would be a love scene. Love is a spiritual thing. Wow, he's so cute. That's something that you learn to have for somebody, whether it be, you know, physically or just emotionally. So yes, the movie is filled with love scenes. Okay. And love-hate scenes. It's too sexy for a shirt. But Marky just loved the rumored $5 million he got from Calvin Klein for dropping his trousers. Will there be any Calvin Klein product placement in this movie? There's me, I, I'm almost in my underwear. Like, for like 20, 10 seconds, I come out of the shower in my underwear. But they're Fruit of the Looms. Army briefs, they're army briefs. Dirty brown army briefs. But they, they're brown, so in case you have an accident. Come on, come on! But did Marky Mark's pure white Calvin stay on when he posed with super waif Kate Moss, or was it just a brief encounter? Yeah, well, Kate got a boyfriend, so I couldn't even start to have a crush on her. But she's nice, you know, we always work together anyway, so then people have always taught me you can't even attempt to get into a, a work relationship, you know, because it's bad. But I did get to see her breasts. What beautiful breasts she has. Hit me! What the heck? Mixing two proven Hollywood formulas has never guaranteed a film's success. Take Undercover Blues, a sort of three men and a baby meets octopusy. Despite the best efforts of Turner and Quaid, this tale of retired secret agents after top secret detonators simply bombed at the US box office. So what will our Cambridge reviewers make of it? Excuse me. Next time, by American. It's basically about Kathleen Turner wearing very little clothing and mud wrestling, a baby looking cute, and Dennis Quaid smiling a lot. It's a very, very bizarre family, but it's also a very endearing and charming one. These two obviously are very much in love, as we can see during the film, and the little baby is integrated into the family. <laughs> Dennis Quaid was a new age super cop father figure. <laughs> He was supposed to be an ex kind of CIA or FBI type fellow who'd settled down to be a family man, but you knew deep down he had these suave, sophisticated James Bond aspirations. The chemistry between the two was just sickening. It has got too much at the end. They were always snogging and always hugging and always going to bed. Kathleen Turner annoyed me, basically. It wasn't in her contract to show her legs in every scene. She brandishes a gun and kicks a lot of people <laughs> and tries to be witty and funny, but. She didn't do much for me. Thanks. The film was neither a, a spoof or a serious comedy, and because I didn't know where it was coming from, I could quite easily have walked out halfway through it. Oh, no. There were so many sidekicks, there was actually no room for a story or any proper action. They just kept filling it up with lots of sight gags that were really a bit flat. <laughs> The realism wasn't so intense, so you could take it at a certain level, you could relax and not worry about what happened to the baddies because it, you know, it just wasn't real. I give Undercover Blues seven. Five out of ten. A three. A light-hearted seven. Which leaves Undercover Blues with 22 points. In part two, our Cambridge reviewers traverse the mean streets of Spanish Harlem in New York with Al Pacino in Carlito's way, and the even meaner streets of Los Angeles' South Central with Menace to Society. 
and I predict that I'll be visiting the set of the forthcoming film Nostradamus and talking with one of its stars, Rutger Hauer, in Romania. See you after the break. Welcome back to Cambridge. So far, our reviewers have rather cold-shouldered friends with 17 points and given Undercover Blues 22 points. In the 70s, the ad men sold up and moved to Hollywood to take a very different sort of commercial break. Now, 10 years after the MTV revolution, it's the pop world's music video directors that have shown movie makers that they too can ring the changes and the cash chills at the box office. Bring it in. Bring it in closer. Perfect. You know, with California, Menace to Society, and CB4, pop promo directors are leaving MTV and trying to rock the box office. But does making a two-minute tone love promo turn you into the next Martin Scorsese? Strike the pose. What happened in the last five to ten years was MTV just became too big for Hollywood to ignore anymore. And they looked at the success of MTV and thought, well, this is what Young America wants. And what Young America wants, Hollywood will pay anything for. Video director Dominic Senna was snatched from Janet Jackson videos to make the movie California. Rap directors of the Hughes Brothers have scored a box office hit with Menace to Society. Wow, punk ass. And Tamara Davis has moved from Sonic Youth and Blue Pearl videos to directing the motion picture CB4. Do you guys respect anything at all? So is pop music the new training ground for the next generation of directors? For me, it was helpful just in that I got to be on the set a lot and got to work a lot. I got to experiment a lot, played with all the blue screen miniatures, uh, tested this, tested that, tested different equipment. What do I like? What don't I like? It was really good experience for me because it let me know what I could do in a day and, you know, kind of got me familiar with how to work, you know, with crews and things like that. So I found it extremely helpful. Do a lot of the clips I've done were sort of, they were sort of little two minute little scenes and then the expanded version of that became the way, you know, you do a feature. So that's how they're doing it. Uh-uh, not according to veteran film director of Scarface and Carlito's Way, Brian De Palma. You have to orchestrate things. You must have silences in order to have noise or, or crescendos. And uh, you have to be able to slowly bring your audience along, this kind of wham, 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 wham works really well in a kind of short form, but it will never sustain for a movie. I just think that's a load of bull. I think you just, you know, I'm just trying to do something that looks interesting and exciting. Some people uh, love the look of it, and others will say, well, it's too stylized, it's too, uh, it looks too good. It looks, you know, it's like, it's like a crime that it looks too interesting. You know, geez, for God's sake, why did he shoot that scene, you know, in the rain at night? I think pop promo directors have a standard image repertoire. You'll see the swinging light bulb. You'll see the kind of the beat up diner, the gas station, the deserts. Um, you'll see like rain, you know, you'll see light coming through kind of blinds. You'll see smoke filtering through light. You see all those images in California. What's that? Nothing, Brad. It was just a thunder. Yes, you have to design your shots, but at the same point, you also really have to make a film and, you know, tell a story and deal with characters and things like that. You are not the sensitive man you used to be. I need love. I mean, shooting a pop video, what do you do? You know, you're trying to make an aging rock star look good while he lip syncs. Uh, that isn't necessarily good training for, uh, for directing an actor. I think one of the most pleasant surprises working on the movie was getting a chance to work with real actors. You can't just say to them, look, I hired you to do this bit in this Janet Jackson video. Just walk from there to there and go get your check. You have to, <laughs> you know, you have to be very sort of diplomatic about it and, and talk about their motivations and, and why it's best he not sit, why it's better that he stand. I used to say that makes me look more pretty. I think if you give this generation time to grow, I'm sure you'll see people maturing into, into good filmmakers. Obviously, a film like Menace to Society is, uh, is remarkably successful. It seems to kind of prove that, that, as far as the Hughes brothers go, they're, they're the kind of one pop promo team that have actually managed to pull it off in Hollywood. Perhaps it is down to the fact that Hughes brothers were able to kind of control the movie and, and set the tone. Throw a message out there through reality. I don't want to preach. It's like, wow, here's how it really goes down, and there's a bunch of negative and positive depictions, and in, in between those, you can read what, what the message is. 
With the fresh perspectives that music video directors are bringing to Hollywood, it's hardly surprising that our next film, Menace to Society, caused such a storm in the media when it was released in the US last year. Shot for less than two million, but raking in 15 times that, this violent tour of teen life in South Central Los Angeles is one film that neither Hollywood nor the box office will ever forget. And won't you give my homeboy a chance? I don't want any trouble. Just get out. I stand, John. I feel sorry for your mother. What you say about my mama? You feel sorry for who? I don't want any trouble. Just huh? get out. You say about my mama? I don't want any trouble. Just huh? get out. You talk to me. Yeah, I'm going to tell my mother. Really you got something to say. I think it's In the first, like, 30 seconds of the film, this makes you go, Oh, good God, what sort of a place is this? Give up the car right now. What sort of a person is this? <laughs> what sort of a society is this? Pow, punk ass. Guns are lying around. Guns are almost an ornament. They're carried, stuck in the belt. Showing a gun is a way of getting respect. And that's the way life is on the street for them. Break yourself, nigga! Break yourself! The whole film was a circle, and you just knew that it couldn't be broken. Kane can't get out of the hood. He's, that's why it's so depressing. But I was frustrated because he didn't try, I don't think, and improve. He was still hitting people, and he knew what the consequences would be. You'll be dead or you'll be in jail. Without Ronnie in the film, it would have been really bleak and depressing. It would have been like, oh, God, this is awful. Everything's bad. They're never going to get anywhere. Why do they bother? Let's just all kill each other now and get it over and done with. It's not just a rap film, it's not just a gangster film, it's a film about real life in a real town. If you like Reservoir Dogs and you like to see a really good story, then go and see this film. I give Menace to Society six. A powerful nine. Nine. A heart pumping ten. Which gives Menace to Society a rather menacing 34 points. Rutger Hauer received his big break when he played a replicant in Blade Runner. Since then, he's been cast as either mad, bad, or dangerous to know. And his latest film, a tale about the medieval mystic Nostradamus, is no exception. I'm on the set of Nostradamus, and I've just witnessed the most extraordinary scene. 50 friars busily flagellating. If you think that sounds crazy, time to meet the maddest monk of them all. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rutger Hauer. But more from him later. Prepare yourselves for a unique journey into male grooming. It's here they've got a production line turning average Romanian citizens into monks. Let's see how it's done. They've got the costumes. Follow me. If you just let this monk out. Oh, fresh. Fresh haircut. I think someone got to him, uh, him already, I guess. Something for the weekend, sir. Rutger, I want to take you away from all this. The characters you normally play have got a kind of mad edge to them. <laughs> Thank you. What's the question? Um, why are you drawn to that rather than being a kind of standard, you know, Hollywood hero? Questions. Would you ever move to Hollywood and sort of live out there? No. Why is, why is that? It's too expensive. Yeah? Too s strange. Strange. How yeah. strange? Well, the, the plants that grow there are really different from any other plants, you know? Really? <laughs> any plants in particular? And they grow so fast, too. <laughs> and, and nature in Hollywood is, is kind of tough to find. Nothing grows on the Hollywood hills. <laughs> You're being I, a tad cryptic. <laughs> no, you yeah. are. But Rutger, what about the glamour, the money, the fame? The hype that surrounds my craft offends me. <laughs> really? Well, no, not really. And but... what sort of things offend you about the hype, you know? Well, because what I do is a different, is something different. It has nothing to do with going to parties or, uh, you know, trying to get rich or trying to make a career or... Huh. No wonder you don't get invited to parties going out dressed like that. I like not being too famous. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the bad thing there? What, what wouldn't you like about being really, you know, kind of... Well, you know, you have to wear a helmet all the time. <laughs> But I think you're pretty famous, to tell you the truth. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to be, tr be like, truthful with you, not, but it's not I'm be like... really truthful with you. You're, quite, you know, you're a famous man. Yeah, but it's not like Redford or, you know, or the, the really big guy, Schwarzenegger. Who the hell are you? Those guys cannot move because their face is, you know, too well known. Ooh, that's a nasty habit. I like honesty and a certain amount of weirdness and a certain amount of directness. I don't want to f 
around that much. Can you say that for this? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They, they, you can say that on any children's television program in Great right. Britain. Okay. They like that word. Please. Which is your favourite ah. leading lady? Which one do you think? Yeah, babe. I smell that coming. Um, <laughs> could you? It was in the wind, wasn't it? If you name one, the other 29 are going to... They're going to be so offended. <laughs> Aren't they? Yeah. I wanted a piece of Rutger. Yeah. I love Teresa Russell. I love Michelle Pfeiffer. Uh, you know. She's a uh, Jennifer J. Lee, I did three films with her. She's lovely. So, uh, and I wasn't exactly bored with her at all. Uh, <laughs> I've had. <laughs> I like those. You like that kind yeah, of girl? Yeah, I like those, yeah. The yeah. girl has spirit. Yeah, I yeah. think it puts, it gives it another edge, you know? Women are not plants, and they're not, you know, they're not toys. You can't blow them up, and, you know, you can't build you, know. <laughs> you can't blow them up. So there we have it, irrefutable proof that Rutger Hauer is weird. Oh, Rutger, don't spare the horses. Uh, Rutger, this isn't the way to the hotel. Rutger, Rutger, Rutger! Tickets. Exactly ten years on from Scarface, director Brian De Palma and Al Pacino have teamed up once again. The result is a film called Carlito's Way, in which Pacino plays an ex-con looking for a new way of life on the mean streets of 70s Spanish Harlem. You gotta put your finger right here. Right on top of the 12, to hold it. Okay. See? Like that? That's right. See, you gotta get lean with that. Is dead, and so are you. Carlito is the sort of hard man type, you know, macho man that it would be great to have a drink with, but you, you would not want to stay the night over his house. Surprise! Carlito is really slick looking and cool, and he's a bit old and past it all now, but he's come out of jail. Thank God Almighty! I'm free at last! He wants to do something with his life and move on from all the trouble he's seen. Hello, Gail. Charlie. Gail's sort of like fairly unbelievable, really. She's a bit too squeaky clean and pure for the area she lives in. Mind you, it's quite realistic that that sort of girl would fancy the classic bad boy. Bust the chain. Poor women in this film just doesn't give them any go whatsoever. You see them either wandering around half naked or snorting cocaine or just flittering by, it's just a waste of time. The poor things didn't get a break with this film. Sean Penn, he looked like a manic Woody Allen. It just didn't look like him, it looked like some kind of weird dweeby fellow with curly hair who was just a total geek. It looked like a 70s cop program, which <laughs> sets the scene nicely. It looked like they got the entire cast of hair to wander around in the background. This film really does establish Brian De Palma as being a bit of a master of the camera as well as being a bit sick and sore when it comes to violence. It's interesting, it's, it's dynamic, it's imaginative, it's good. I give Carlito's Way eight. Seven out of ten. I give it eight. Eight. Giving Carlito's Way 31 points and making Menace to Society our movie watch recommendation of the week. And that's it from Cambridge. Next week, Blackpool reviews, appropriately, Bargy on the Beach and Woody's Manhattan Murder Mystery. Laurie gets all girly with Emma Thompson. I wouldn't be seen dead at night so in training. And Tim Roth tells us why Hollywood is his cup of tea. It's great, I think it's great. And I mean to the hard men of Hollywood, the stuntmen. So that's Movie Watch from Blackpool. I'll see you there. Here I've got a beat of honor. Don't you know that I'm in a garden of Vita, baby Don't you know that her home is the truth?